technique of closed reduction. This video has been produced a book source. We would like to thank editor John Charnley. Books has intrinsic value when physically held. Hence, anyone interested may purchase the book. The reference is provided below. Despite the disadvantages of the closed method, it is important that the best method of performing it should be known, for there are many cases where operation is contraindicated. Perhaps the commonest method of attempting the closed reduction of this forearm fracture follows the technique described by Baller in which traction is applied to the fingers, while countertraction is applied at the elbow by a webbing sling attached to a hook on the wall. The main objection to this method is that the countertraction sling makes it impossible to apply a full arm plaster except by applying it in two separate stages. Another objection is that the horizontal position favors deformity by the sagging of the bones under the action of gravity. By holding the forearm vertically, suspended from the thumb and index finger, the weight of the arm and gravity helps in proximal part of the forearm. Will apply its own traction and a full placer can be applied in one stage in the vertical position of the forearm there is no tendency for the fragments to sag and parallel alignment is favored figure the vertical technique the following technique includes several points which though apparently trivial contribute materially to ultimate success the patient is fully anesthetized to secure relaxation. The forearm is suspended vertically by attaching monkey puzzles or clove hitch knots to the thumb, index, and middle fingers. And these are suspended from any convenient overhead frame and intravenous drip stand is very convenient because it allows the height to be varied. The thumb is suspended separately from the index and middle fingers to facilitate the passage of the placer bandage round the palm. Figure. The patient lies horizontally on the table and the height of the suspension is adjusted so that the arm is horizontal. And, therefore, with the forearm vertical, the elbow is exactly at 90 degrees. A slight increase in traction. To assist reduction can be applied by an assistant exerting downward pressure on the arm or by gripping the epicondyless and pulling downwards. The fracture is now manipulated by applied pressure at the level of the fracture. The surgeon squeezing the forearm between his hands with the C squeezing grip shown in figure. During this procedure the forearm is best held in supination so that the squeeze separates the forearm bones from one another. Thereafter the forearm can be allowed to fall into the natural position of mid-pronation. An X-ray film should be taken at this stage to check the reduction. If an X-ray shows that one or both of the bones are still overriding, it is obvious that the swelling of the forearm or the fibrous elements in the Forearm are offering a mechanical barrier to elongation. It is useless in this case to repeat the same manipulation. My own experience has been that the use of longitudinal traction continuously for several minutes, as recommended by Bowler, rarely succeeds, though when using local anesthesia it might well be important. If, therefore, Length is not secured in the first attempt. The second attempt should be made by the maneuver of increasing the deformity followed by straightening the limb when a position has been secured. After this manipulation, the forearm should again be suspended by the digits for the application of the plaster. It is advisable to apply a single layer of wool before applying the plaster, a skin tight plaster provides no better mechanical fixation than a padded plaster skillfully applied, and the removal or splitting of a skin-tight plaster may necessitate an anesthetic or otherwise inflict great discomfort on the patient. The application of adhesive felt pads to the head of the ulna, and particularly to the medial epicondyla at the elbow, is a trivial detail but one strongly to be recommended. These are often sources of great discomfort and may prevent the 
patient rehabilitating in the cast because of pain. The plaster is applied from the knuckles to the lower part of the axilla with the forearm in mid position. During the application of the plaster, an assistant must hold the elbow by the epicondyles to prevent its swaying from side to side as the turns of the plaster are applied. Two points in the application of this plaster deserve special emphasis. One, the thumb. It is a common practice to cut away the plaster from the base of the thumb so as to expose the whole of the thenar eminence with the object of leaving the first metacarpal free to perform a complete circumduction at the carpal metacarpal joint. This well-intended notion brings in its train an unfortunate sequel. The tendency for the radius to shorten by collapse of the distal fragment towards the ulna can logically be prevented only by some form of traction applied to the thumb. But cutting away the plaster from the thumb invites collapse of the radius by removing purchase on the thumb. The radius then collapses and the base of the thumb is drawn back against the margin of the plaster and a pressure sore develops at the base of the thumb. TO relieve this point of pressure futile attempts are often made to pack lint between the skin and the plaster to cut the plaster farther. Back merely results in another pressure, sore, and further collapse of the radial fragment. For this reason, I am convinced that the thumb should always be enclosed up to the inner phalangeal joint just as in the treatment of a scaphoid fracture. This introduces a slight traction element to resist shortening and certainly makes the patient comfortable. If the thumb is brought round to oppose the fingers as it should be in the treatment of a scaphoid fracture, there is no danger of stiffness even if the thumb is so fixed for 12 weeks. Thanks for watching. Subscribe.